Hey you guys, what's up and welcome back to Two Toe Tags Metal Reviews and today we're getting our final review of Verminous from the Black Dahlia Murder. Okay, we have spent the entire week listening to this album non-stop as much as we possibly can. TV Fish, take the floor. What's up? What All right. Think? This album was very impressive. And I'm gonna start by saying one thing about it. Now, we mentioned last week, this album is extremely short. Half an hour. 30, 36 minutes. 36 minutes. Super short. And when it comes to albums like these, they really, you know, the test of time is a lot harsher on albums like these because you'll be hearing it on loop more often because of how short it is. And it's a lot easier to grow tired of it because of that. True. Did that happen to me? The answer is, no. This album did not get tired on me, and I think it's because a good, the majority of this album I find is really interesting and has a lot of unique things in it that stand out to me, and a lot of cool riffs. I think that's one of the biggest things about this album that's great is it's riffing. Mm -hmm. And in a song called How Very Dead, which is what, track number seven, I believe, the riff that happens in the chorus is so simple. The guy is just walking down the minor scale, like just going down, and you know, it, it sounds awesome though. And I love how Trevor Sternad sounds in it as well. The lyrics of this album are really cool, really nasty. Mm -hmm. And one that was kind of one thing I kind of noticed throughout the album is that there's a lot of simple riffing patterns, a lot of things that aren't overly complex, but it works. And I'm not saying that oh, it's simple, it's a bad thing. It, it's straightforward and it's effective. Like it sounds awesome, it's catchy, but they have interesting stuff. They have interesting time signature changes that are happening in this album that are really subtle. Yeah, and I think that's totally awesome. Like in Sunless Empire, they're kind of moving around between four, four and six, uh, eight. And it's such a cool thing that they kind of make it all overlap on itself. And it's not like it throws you off. So it's one of the most interesting things of that song. That song is still amazing, by the way. It's still probably my favorite song in the album because it's just ridiculous, and it has an amazing solo. But you know what else has an amazing solo? Dawn of Rats. Yeah. The solo on that song functions in so many different ways. One, it's the last song in the album. With how much emotion there is in that guitar solo, and how conclusive that song feels, mm -hmm. it, it goes hand in hand, and the so solo sounds awesome from there. But the rhythm guitar in that solo complements it directly, and it feels amazing when you listen to it. Like, I remember at one point I heard that song and I heard that solo and I thought, wow, how did I not realize how great this solo is when I first heard the song? But that's why we listen to these albums for a week before reviewing them, because if it wasn't for that, if we just reviewed it the day that it came out, yeah. you know, what I just said, I wouldn't have said. Exactly. And you're right that there's a lot of uh, things that kind of just feel kind of simple, but they work. There's also a lot of things about this album that are not simple that are actually quite technical. And it takes a little bit of uh, focus and a little bit of kind of just figuring out what is really going on. Sunless Empire is a really cool song. It was actually part of that song that they do a couple of times on the guitar. Um, it happens kind of just before the solo and during the chorus sections. I'm not exactly sure what he's doing. He's either tremolo picking an arpeggiated riff or he's tremolo picking just a lead riff. But either way, it just sounds really cool. Um, I, I can't obviously do it with my voice, so you guys gotta just go listen to it and you'll probably hear what I'm what I'm talking about. But there's a lot of parts on this album where um, he'll be playing like a riff and he'll tremolo pick certain parts of it, and it just adds this flavor to the song and to the to the riff, and it just makes it like just more bodied, which is really cool. They do play around with time signatures a lot. The most they do that is in the single Child of Night. Um, they do this this cool thing at the beginning, and it actually repeats throughout the song, but they do this thing where they do um, a, a bar of 6-4, and then they go to a bar of 5-4, and they do that a couple times. Then the song kicks into a 4-4 four, four regular time signature through most of it. The chorus is 6-8, um, and they repeat that 6-4, uh, 5-4 four, four pattern throughout the song. It's in the outro as well. So they kind of bounce around through a lot of different things. My favorite song, though, was not Sunless Empire, it was not Dawn of Rats, it was not Child of Night. My favorite song was A Leather Apron Scorn. All right, before you talk about this, I want to preface your your thing about this song. Earlier this week, Vile said to me, he's like, yo, 
there's something I noticed about this song that's totally awesome. I don't know if it's intentional or not. There's something super cool. And I said to him, I'm like, look, don't tell me. I want my genuine reaction to this finding to be right here, right now in this review. So tell us, please, what's this crazy finding about a Leather Apron Scorn? Okay. Well, Leather Apron Scorn, really cool song. Uh, first of all, to say lyrically, it's about the killings of Whitechapel saying, uh, from the perspective of Jack the Ripper himself, which is pretty cool. But in this song, at the two minute and 50 second mark, there's a riff that plays. And it's an awesome riff. Whenever I heard that riff, I thought, this is a badass riff. So the riff plays for two bars, and then on the third bar, he plays the same riff, but he tremolo picks the riff, which sounds fucking awesome. During that, the double bass kicks in at, you know, 16th notes. It's just a sick bar. It's awesome. So I heard that and I thought, this is really cool. It's like my favorite single spot on the entire album just sounds so cool. Then I was like, you know what? A lot of times bands, when they play riffs, they have riffs earlier in the song too. They just repeat them later on and they kind of do this bookend kind of thing. So I re-listened to the song and I was looking for that riff again and it's not there. Well, it kind of is there, but they never play the full riff. And I found that very interesting. Throughout the whole song, they play part of the riff and they always cut off. They always, they never finish the riff. So when I'm listening to it now, there's this sense of like, I need this riff like to finish. They're, they're teasing it. Then when at the it end finally of the song, happens, you get the whole riff and it's so satisfying. And I don't know if that was done on purpose or if that was done just because that's how they wrote the song and that's how it turned out. But I thought that was fucking mint. That totally I sounds like that. something that would be that would be like intentional. Like, okay, we're gonna tease the riff a bunch of times in this song, and at the end, we're gonna play the full thing. That's totally. That seems like it would totally be intentional. When we're done, really when we're cool. done recording this, I'll play. We'll play the song. Yeah. I'll point out the riff too. You probably know the riff I'm talking about. But listen through the song, and you'll you'll hear they 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 play the riff and they never finish it. There's always something like it's almost like a syncopated thing where they keep interrupting it and going to the next part. I just love that. That that's is really cool. Yeah, that's that's. I found that to be super creative, and it just leaves you hanging. It leaves you wanting and craving that riff, craving that riff. And then finally, when it happens, everything else kind of breaks down, and then you hear, you finally hear the riff in its full glory, and you're like, yes. And then he tremble picks it, and you're like, yes. <laughs> See, it's really cool. Another cool thing I really like about that song is how it breaks up the pace of the album. It's still a nasty, you know, vile song, but like. It's slower tempo, the drums aren't constantly blasting in your face, so yeah. it's awesome that that kind of stands out on its own among the album. Yeah, I actually did beat count through the, all the songs in this album, and that is the slowest song. It's 150 BPM. Um, the fastest is actually, the fastest song is actually Godlessly at 250. 250, yeah, not bad. A song I want to talk about is The Wereworms Feast, and ah. this song it's individual because you did mention last week it kind of has like a little black metal vibe. Yep. The more I listened to this song, the more I thought to myself, you know what? This sounds like a Cradle of Filth song. Yeah. And it's funny because I brought it up to you throughout the week and then you told me later I was I, thinking the exact the same, same thing. And I think it's part of it is because the overall timbre of Trevor Sternad's voice honestly sounds a lot like Danny Filth's voice. Yeah. And a, another huge part of it is the rhythm of his voice. The like, the kind of eighth notes that are going on. Yep. That is totally what Danny Phil does. Listen to any Cradle of Filth and you'll hear that. It's textbook Cradle. So I just found so much overlap and I'm like, the way this song's put together, the way the riffs are, the way the guitars sound, like it really does sound like a Cradle song. Not to say that, oh, they're just ripping off Cradle. No, it's an awesome comparison because it's like, wow, yeah. we have this song on the album that has a black metal vibe, black metal vibe, and honestly, it's just reminiscent of Cradle of Filth. So it's just another piece of the album that juts out and stands out. Yeah, I felt like Dawn of Rats actually had a lot of Cradle vibes too. It was giving me like, that song has like, um, I what's that song? That. Lust, Mortem, Orgasm type of energy. You know what I mean? It doesn't sound quite like that, but just the energy that it has, I was like drawing comparisons there. Very Cradle-esque. I am curious though, like one of the challenges I kind of saw for this album was the like first chunk. From Verminous up to, you know, through Child of Night, I was kind of thinking, okay, are these songs like, you know, our issue with those songs is that they sound too quote unquote typical for the band. But what were your thoughts on them like after a week of listening? Um, that was actually one of the like tests that I was like putting forth with this album was, is this just gonna remind me of every other Black Dahlia Murder album, which they kind of all seem to blend into a very finely knit pot of kind of the same stuff over and over again. And it did and it didn't. Um, like I can give you one example um, in Godlessly, uh, there's a part, 
at around the two minute and 20, two minute, 15 second mark. Um, that reminds me a lot of Deathmatch Divine. There's a part in Deathmatch Divine, which is about, I wrote it down here, so I'm not just making this up. It's about 120 on Deathmatch Divine, and it's about 215 on Godlessly. Um, rhythmically, uh, and just the pattern and all that stuff, the part, those parts of those two songs are very similar to me. I was getting a lot of throwbacks. Um, I think they did enough on this album to make it stand out and not seem like rinse repeat of old stuff. But of course you're gonna hear the stylistic, you know, riffing and the stylistic yeah. vocals and stuff that you heard on other albums. You yeah. can't get away from that's, that. That's just the band. You but know? I I think they did enough on most of these songs, if not all of them, to make each song set apart, stand out and kind of, um, you know, impress me in its own way. Well, with that being said, what do you rate it? I had one issue with this album, okay? And that was A Womb in Dark Chrysalis. Now I have no real issue with, that's the interlude track, okay? It's the second last track. I have no real issue with the track. I feel like the track is fine. 49 seconds or whatever of just kind of soft instrumental. My problem is its placement. I felt like it was placed very awkwardly. Not a big deal. I probably would have put it as the intro track. This very beginning of the album as the first track and then bleed into Verminous and then chaos ensues. Um, but with that being said, I give a, a toe tag to this album. I think this is um, a really stellar album. It actually impressed me more than I thought. I was expecting to get bored of it, like you said at the beginning. I did not. A lot of things started standing out at me. I started finding really cool things all over the place. Awesome album. All right, so for me, you know, like I mentioned, the kind of test was, can this first chunk of the album, you know, match the latter chunk? And you know, for me, I think it's good. I think that chunk of the album was good enough to hold it together and from you know Sunless Empire onward it's just fucking awesome this album also gets my toe tag because it's just it's got enough to it that it does stand out and it's just such a solid overall album you're gonna get a lot of really interesting stuff that's kind of new for the band but you're also gonna get a lot of stuff that you're used to when you listen to this album for the band it's very true so that's it guys two toe tags for Verminous an album you guys should check it out and let us know in the comments below what you guys think if you agree with us or not comment down below but that's it for this video guys so make sure you like it if you liked it subscribe if you guys are new to the channel i'm vile self i'm tv fish we'll see you guys on the next video keep those heads banging